All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'll give a brief introduction. I'm gonna hand it off to Kevin, who's gonna be moderating the panel. So my name is Michael Blue. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Event Hub. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be providing the virtual venue for this year's conference and also sponsoring this panel. Uh, funny enough, we have more expertise in consumer events than we do B2B. And this panel really resonated with us and myself personally because we work with both sporting events like the New York Marathon and Hoop Fest, as well as music properties like Riverbend Festival and Newport Jazz Festival in the OC. So with that, we've been able to really watch as music partnerships has, have evolved and started to catch up with the higher level of sophistication that's been uh, employed by the sporting industry for some time now. Uh, very briefly, if you don't know what Event Hub is, we are a sponsorship platform that pairs partners with event opportunities. So to that effect, we have a marketplace for targeting events. And then we also have each event having a showcase page that lists all of their potential partnership opportunities. We combine that with a streamlined management suite, which is really streamlining all of your inquiries, payments, paperwork, logistics, uh, live floor plan for placement. Uh, and then we also, because of COVID, added a virtual experience, which is the one you're using today. So that can be used for consumer events for everything from virtual fan experiences to uh, sporting expos and things of that nature to obviously B2B conferences. So uh, really, again, excited to be hosting this. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about us, check out our virtual booth, talk to us during the live expo sessions, which are on the schedule, um, or DM me in our Slack channel for EAMC. And if you haven't joined the Slack channel, be sure to do it. There's some really good conversations going there. So with that, I'm very, very excited, and it's great, my great pleasure to introduce you on Music Partnerships. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh... Thanks for joining us today. Welcome uh, to the next session, as Michael said. Uh, this is uh, Music and Brand Partnerships, an evolution here to stay, uh, which is, of course, sponsored by Event Hub. Uh, my name is Kevin Mel Hewish from Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, and I'll be the moderator uh, for this panel. Uh, just some housekeeping on flow to kick us off. We'll have probably about a half hour, 35 minutes of discussion. Uh, we have purposefully left about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So for those of you that have questions, please do submit them in the chat. Uh, we'll hold time and we'll address as many of them as we can uh, before our time is up. Uh, to introduce you to our panel, joining us today, we have Shannon, Deirdre, and Alan. Shannon Cole is the Senior Director of Brand Marketing at the Royal Bank of Canada. In this role, Shannon leads the bank's global sponsorship portfolio which spans Olympics, golf, RBCX music, and much more. Deirdre Malloy is the head of brand partnerships at Live Nation Canada, working with a portfolio of brand partners across nearly all categories. Prior to Live Nation, Deirdre spent 13 years at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment in various marketing and partnership roles across both sports and music properties. And Alan Palmer is a senior vice president at Wasserman Media Group, he currently leads regional growth for the agency in Canada and previously led the growth and development team at Wasserman in New York. Shannon, Deirdre, Alan, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. I'd, uh, I'd like to begin our discussion with you, Alan, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, you, uh, you see things from a whole bunch of different perspectives at Wasserman. Can you start off talking to us about why you think brands should be making investments in music? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, for, for just context, probably best to start, you know, why do brands even look at sponsorships and partnerships? And typically we find that they do it for three, you know, different reasons at the most basic level. Obviously it's to build awareness for that brand. It's to drive consideration or purchase or build brand affinity or get people to really love that brand. And ideally, brands are doing this in a really effective, efficient way to a desired audience or their target audience they're trying to reach. And as we've seen with the media landscape over the past couple of years, just continue to fragment, frankly, and become incredibly cluttered um, across platforms, devices, and, and subscription services, which I'm sure we could all kind of count how many subscription services we've all kind of built up over the past 16 months while uh, being stuck at home. Um, but it's never been more complicated, I think, for brands to really find and reach and connect with these targeted audiences. 
And so some of the most sophisticated and progressive brands out there like RBC and, and Shannon, frankly, are utilizing sponsorship as a really central and core part to their integrated marketing strategy to reach these audiences at the moments that matter the most to those audiences they're trying to reach. And so music along with sports and, and other live entertainment aspect, uh, um, options are really kind of dependent on the brand um, and who are they ultimately trying to reach. But I think with the benefits of music that we see a lot from our perspective is there's a really uh, unique opportunity to create a truly deep emotional connection with audiences via music versus through sports. And the audiences that are actually at the, a lot of these music events are some of the more, most influential audiences that brands can actually reach. So this ability to access and connect with this influential audience kind of coupled with the increased demand for live, live entertainment and, and frankly, you know, access to music really makes it a foundational uh, part uh, of numerous brand uh, sponsorship strategies in which we advise clients for all across the world. And Shannon, I'll, I'll look to you. You're the one that's in the brand seat here with a whole bunch of different stakeholders and a whole bunch of different properties. You've created RBCX Music, um, which is specific to RBC. Can you talk about why the decision was made as to why the bank is invested in music? Yeah, for sure. And um, hopefully you can hear me. Thanks for having me. I wish we were um, on a podium together somewhere instead of on screen, but um, appreciate being here, Kevin. Um, I think Alan touched on on a lot of it, and maybe I would just give a perspective from, from RBCs specifically. But um, yeah, when, when we enter into sponsorships, I think you know, we have to look at it both, both through a brand lens and a business lens. And if you look at it from a brand perspective, perspective, you know, we would use sponsorship and frankly, all of our brand marketing efforts to move the, move the needle across like a specific subset of people um, with specific brand measurables. And so way up at the top of, you know, the sales funnel, if you think of it that way, um, we're, we're trying to target a specific group of people. You mentioned some of the other investments we've made uh, off the top there. If, if you look at what we're doing in golf, that's a huge US awareness driver for us. Um, we have Canadian extensions, of course, but that's the main purpose of it. Olympics, it's very mass consumer, it's patriotic, it's almost like a citizenship feel to it. But when we looked um, across our portfolio, there was a bit of a void to fill. Um, with young Canadians um, and music was honestly like the perfect way to fill that void. Yes, it appeals to like a wide and, and very diverse broad audience, but um, I think it was really like young Canadians propensity to attend, to consume live events, all of those things ticked a ton of boxes for us. Um, and so RBCX Music was born and we, we were really trying to leverage this power of music to round out um, not only who we're going after, but this kind of broader company-wide commitment to, to youth. And um, our partnership with, with Live Nation is an enormous part of that. I, I think, you know, it's been part of the reason why I can confidently say, like, we've moved the needle with that cohort of people over the last few years. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, a great vehicle for us and will continue to be. Yeah, the, if I could just chime in for one second there, I think the only thing that I would I would maybe want to double down on from a music perspective and recognize, Shannon, um, you guys are trying to achieve a, a youth strategy. Like music is such a, it's so universal and it really does mm -hmm. provide something for everyone based on the genres and the fans. And any night of the week, you could be at a hip hop show one night, a classic rock show the next night, and you're seeing 20 different thousand people every night of the week, which really does provide brands a, a unique opportunity to be able to, align with wherever their priorities really are, which is, is something that maybe differentiates it a little bit from sports, I'd say. Yeah, there's almost like a universal appeal to music that most brands, again, I can't speak for all brands, but you, you would likely be able to unlock that magic in some shape or form, depending on, um, like you said, the, the diverse uh, roster that it brings. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, Shannon, because in the way that you see it as a bank and a brand, you've really made a long-term commitment to music. This is not tactical. This is not three months. This is not a particular venue. 
Deirdre, I'd be curious from your perspective, is that the right way to go about doing it? Is it is a longer term investment or a longer term vision uh, more successful for brands? I would definitely say so. I mean, I, I think the notion and we've all probably seen examples of it, like one one and done type of stuff. I don't know if you're really providing um, yourself with enough uh, runway to really prove out any kind of success or ROI and just the, the, the fluid nature of the music cycle. I think year over year, I think also is a is an implication there. So I do think term is a is a big thing. I do think investing in telling the story and activating behind all the rights that you've purchased by way of the property or, or venue or wherever you may be focused on that side of things is also super important. Like you've seen such like, I'll use Amex front of the line as I always do as one of those like age old examples of they've just homed in and it's, it's, it's very consistent. It's, it's a, a trusted message. It's, you know, you have access. It's become synonymous with entertainment. And I think there's something to be said for that longevity. Yeah, I think if I can build on that, I think, you know, it's the brands that are shifting from like a brand engagement mindset to actually like being more of like cultural investors into music, where we're seeing the most amount of lift and success come out of the music space. I think the challenge, frankly, though, and I love Shannon's perspective on this from a brand is a lot of brand marketers are measured, you know, two quarters out. They're not measured two, three years out, which sometimes, you know, when it comes to music, it's really about that longer tail and that longer investment and how that can truly influence and affect the brand perception with that audience. Yeah, you're you're reading my diaries, Alan. I I, <laughs> I mean that that's like that's that's the the ongoing kind of evergreen battles that I think marketers and sponsorship marketers um, have to you know kind of push for. And again, I know that's not maybe the purpose of this this panel, but I. That's why terms always important when we're negotiating. I think it's um, and a fully baked budget, which would include an activation budget, because I think those are some of the first things that can go. Um, if you have a quarter that doesn't go your way, if you have, um, you know, an unexpected global pandemic, which um, you know pushes resources in in unexpected ways. So yeah, it's it's protecting that uh, investment and and doing it over time. Yeah, I mean, and you touched upon it, you you essentially created your own music brand within RBC, like RBC X Music started from scratch. It's going to take a minute, I think, for you guys to figure out what are all those tactics that are going to prove to be successful for you guys? Are you reaching the right people? Like, how are we amplifying it? How are we growing it? How is it evolving? That takes a minute. It does. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you bring up an interesting point, Deirdre. Uh, Amex from the line has been in market for 20 plus years. We've been talking about capital B branding, but brand partnerships can really be leveraged as a, as a marketing vehicle. And I'd argue that there's a flywheel effect here, selling tickets, promoting shows, uh, promoting venues. It, there's, there's a whole value add here as part of the ecosystem. Um, RBC, of course, Shannon, I'll, I'll ask you about this in a bit, but, but Deirdre, from your perspective, is there a proper way that brands should be thinking about brand partnerships as a marketing vehicle for shows and for venues? Because I, I assume actually a lot of our audience here are show marketers or venue marketers. And the, there's a tactical component of that that's a little bit different than building the long-term value um, of an RBC customer, for example. Yeah, and I, and I, I will turn it very quickly over to Shannon because I, I know a pillar of your partnership is a ticket program that you guys see a lot of value in. It obviously differentiates you guys from your, your competition and provides value for your customers. Um, Self-serving on our side because it moves tickets for our shows. So it definitely, um, to your point, uh, Kevin, there is multiple um, touch points that I think from a brand partnerships perspective, whether that's moving tickets, whether that's underwriting shows, whether that's helping with routing, whether that's putting dollars into artists pockets like there's there's so many different areas that can just prove it further proves that brand partnerships is such a pivotal becoming increasingly such a, an important part of the music ecosystem if you will um but shannon I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on on what the ticket program i'm hoping she's not frozen is she is she frozen do we think i know she was having some technical difficulties before yeah <laughs> I, I think we might have lost her we might have lost her. Well, um, 
RBC, for those RBC customers out there, they have a great ticket program and have access to um, all of the Live Nation shows nationally. So um, I think there's there's a, obviously a, a consumer benefit and a customer benefit there and, and um, their customers are our fans. So it's, it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting program too, Dee, because it's, it, that stuff takes like a little bit more effort, a little more creativity and sometimes, not always, but sometimes an additional investment from partners. But, you know, really that's, those are the things that you consistently see the returns come back is the fact that it is thinking about the holistic ecosystem versus signage and or spots and dots, right? And some Absolutely. of those vanity metrics that we yeah. see. Absolutely. So, and, and especially if, if we look at the last year, I, I don't want to spend time talking about the negative aspects of the pandemic that we've been living through. But I do think that there's quite a bit of positive change. The industry, I would suggest, has accelerated quicker uh, than we previously had thought. Frankly, we lost a lot of physical spaces or festivals, for example, where you can reach scale. And, and we've seen really the emergence of new platforms. Deirdre, you hit on it uh, previously, TikTok, Spotify, everything else. That The ecosystem is continually changing. Maybe I'll start with you, Alan. Like, where, where's your head at of if I'm a marketer or if, or if I work at a venue, how can I think about my business for the rest of 21 into 2022 and longer so that I remain relevant and I, and I reach the right audience? Because we were talking about it's, it's getting a, a specific customer that's a bit different than, say, a sports property. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, it's, it's interesting. I think there's never been a better time to probably throw out some of the historical rule books that, that existed. Um, and we probably perpetuated and built some of those uh, people on the stage, but also some of the audience here. And I think now is really an interesting time to break down some of those barriers. And if you look at some other industries, what they've done um, and how they've kind of shifted from distribution models and, and so on and so forth, um, I think there's a lot that can be garnered from that. I think we're going to see continued... Um, you know, innovation and investment from a streaming perspective. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Live Nation and Deidre and, and that team, obviously their investment from a venue standpoint, but also, you know, uh, investments in like streaming platforms like Veeps and others. Um, yep. We're going to see a lot of, of that continued on. Um, but I think what really what it's going to be is that's going to be incremental um, access. I don't think we'll ever see the replacement of live um, from our, my perspective. I think what we're going to see is a pent up demand of a year and a half, um, but it's your competition is going to start shifting. It's not going to just be the other venues in your market. It's going to be venues all around the world because people can stream and watch from home, but it's going to be about how can you create really, really unique, compelling experiences in your particular environment that actually is ownable and, and unique to that. And it's going to be a challenge to get there. I think, uh, as we all know, there's new protocols, there's new investments that need to happen. And I think this is really where there's some nice symbiotic opportunity for some brand partners to start focusing on some of those, those pain points and support in that way and really go back to that investment mindset that which we're talking about. And I think, you know, now that Shannon's back, but Shannon, you should know, you had a very nice uh, freeze frame, not an unattractive freeze <laughs> she frame. She really did. I noticed, I noticed that also. <laughs> I am so stressed right now. Like uh, I am sweating over here. So, so I, I think, you know, what we'll see is continued, you know, that, but I think the live experience, we're never going to replace just to, to summarize. I think, you know, we'll, we'll see open access live streaming on Twitch and, and other places continue YouTube. I think you'll see some of these digital paid models continue to go down that people should be thinking about. But I also think, you know, you've got your wave XR, and some of these kind of more like immersive experiences, what Billy Eilish has recently done. I think that's gonna be a whole new revenue stream and space we can play with. In-game concerts obviously was happening prior to COVID. I think we're gonna see more of that. Um, but then I think it's also, there's some really smart creative ways that um, we can bring people back uh, to the venues. And I think that's what people need to be thinking about is how, when people are coming out on the other side of this, just to tie back to your question, because I think that's really what you're asking was, you know, what should we be thinking about? And I think it's about as people return and return to live, how do we, how do we really bring that emotional experience back to life that we all are craving? And I think almost most importantly is we've all been so digitally connected. 
I personally can't wait for the moment that I can be in a group of strangers getting sweaty, listening to a music that I have an emotional response to. And I think that just the faster we can get to those places, the better off that we'll be able to start creating some, uh, you know, really compelling models and, and ways in which we can find brand connection into the music space. Yeah, Deirdre, just, I, I'm curious if you're on the, the other side of it, obviously, I think we all are quite optimistic for what the future is and, and, and bullish of what the return to life looks like. Are you of the same mindset of Alan that things have changed, but things have changed probably for the better? Um, I mean, yeah, when it comes to like innovation or streaming and all that stuff, I couldn't agree with you more, Alan. Like I see that as being completely complementary to the live experience i mean i even think back to years ago when like we were talking about in-game like vr and everyone wearing the glasses is that going to replace like sitting courtside it's like that will never replace sitting <laughs> sitting courtside i don't believe so anyways but it will absolutely provide new revenue streams for artists new revenue streams for properties venues whatever the case may be um so i do think that there's um innovative changes that are just going to make us better for sure the return to live i mean and this could be me in Toronto, given we've been in lockdown for what feels like like eternity. Um, I don't know if we need to even try that hard to get that emotional connection. Like everyone, like you, and we like just to talk about what we're seeing from a show perspective and tours and all of our festivals that are going on sale and selling out within like no time down in the U.S. and even globally, the demand is there. Like research all along has shown that fans want to be coming back. So it's only a matter of of when, not necessarily how obviously safety and all of that kind of stuff taken into consideration but the people want to come back <laughs> yeah i think we've seen the fan demand is there that is not just a north america thing it's been global as well with all the uk festivals but but Deirdre, you're, you you hit on a, a really important piece there is the demand is there and why people are going to show up has changed but i think also the way that an artist is going to show up has also changed. And an artist, particularly in the last year, they were always a brand in themselves, but particularly over the last year, artists seeing themselves as a brand has really picked up quite a bit. Do you, do you mind giving some, some commentary on that, Deirdre? Um, yeah, and, and you and I would have chatted about this before we started the panel. Like, I think now more than ever, artists are brands in and of themselves. So when you look at that branded content and the alignment of brands with with artists, I think it's it's more it, it's becoming more and more important that that's an authentic tie because I think there's a whole generation of artists like you think of the Post Malones, the Billie Eilishes, the Lizzos, like they actually care. They want to be making sure that where their values their values are lining up authentically with brand values, and it makes sense. I think you're creating better content that way. I think you're creating better partnership that way versus trying to, to force fit stuff. And, and yeah, like you're, there's, there's tons of examples now of the Travis Scott's and BTS doing McDonald's meal. Like it, it's crazy what you're seeing now. And so many artists now are even, they have their, their own festivals, their own spirits, their own makeup lines, all of that kind of stuff. So the synergies that you see, I think within the brand artist space, I think is only gonna become a, a bigger thing moving forward. Shannon, I'll, I'll uh, welcome back also. I have not addressed you personally yet. So I'll go to I'm you I'm like, next can on, you uh, hear me? Can you? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. okay. I'm, you're good. Okay. Oh. So RBC, you guys have worked with a bunch of artists, uh, both big and small over the last, uh, last few years. When you guys are, are looking at how to get talent or how to get an artist involved with a brand partnership, uh, what's going through your head or what's going into your decision criteria as to how you're looking at, at artists as part of your, your overall programming? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what we want to do with them. I think first and foremost, I mean, we, we have sort of a roster of, of artists who we've partnered with, um, some tiny and emerging and their needs are different and we're trying to partner with them to actually give them exposure and um, performance opportunities and all that kind of thing. Um, but we've also done, you know, things over the years with larger names like Jesse Reyes or Kate Trinata or Arkells, Haim, even OVO um, a couple of years ago. And I think um, there's a time and a place probably for, that whole um, continuum of, of artists, depending on where they are in their um, career life cycle. But 
Um, we like to say, you know, some of those big names just help to add rocket fuel or gasoline to whatever campaign you're doing, right? That's um, important if we're trying to build awareness about a program. Um, it's important if we're trying to shine a light on a specific cause that we're partnering on. Um, and so, you know, kind of back to your original question, what do we look for? I think um, we have really clearly defined um you know, values for our organization. We have very, very clearly defined purpose and um, why would we, why we would we be doing things. And we try to align with with those particular um, types of acts. I think, you know, you kind of hit on it or you were alluding to it. The pandemic has almost accelerated that um, in a lot of ways where bands and, and performers have had to get a bit creative. They've been willing to partner with brands maybe a little bit more than before because so many of their other revenue streams all but disappeared. So um, it's been kind of fun and interesting to see what's transpired as a result of that. Um, and then maybe the final thing that I'll, I'll say about partnering with a, a big name is um, what's been great to see is they are eager to and enjoy the mentorship part of the business. And that's really important for us. So um, to be able to host master classes um, where they can share their lived experience with artists who are trying to break it in the business, that has been um, almost like a, a magic special sauce for us over the last um, year or so. So that's what I would say to that. And hey, it's it's not without its heartburn working with artists, that's for sure. And I'm sure Shannon could equally go into the other direction and, and tell a couple of stories on that side. But um, I think there's plenty of examples of when you when you have the right brand and, and artists together, like there's there can be lightning in a bottle that can create some really great stuff in market. And I and I think the landscape to go back to the the, the you know fragmentation of channels and platforms and whatnot, like if you even go back to music prior, like think about what mu like musicians did on when radio came out or like when MTV launched and the creativity that I unleashed from a music video standpoint. And I think just getting to that next level now of thinking about, you know, what some of those artists are going to be able to do on some of these platforms in partnership with the live experience. Right. And so how can they bring more, more fans into them and build, build these connections, right? Like Ruth B, you know, I don't know if everyone saw what she did with Minecraft of actually like encouraging people to build like their own kind of custom concert environments prior to her doing a stream, like just all these different spaces and places, I think are just going to allow us to really see some of this creativity unleashed by these artists, um, which is going to be really exciting to see. Yeah. For, from a, from a brand standpoint, there's often a brand wanting to be in control of things. Obviously when we're working in the, the entertainment industry or when we're working with talent, there's of course going to be a degree where a brand cannot control what goes on, nor frankly will they probably want to. There's a reason you're working in the space um, as, as a whole. Shannon, I, I'd look to you. Is that something that makes, maybe not you directly, but is that something that makes others within the bank or, or other stakeholders uncomfortable giving up that element of control or is that welcome? Uh, more uncomfortable than, than not, I think, but you have to be comfortable with that feeling, I think. Um, and it's hard and it's, it's, um, it's new. And I think certainly for a brand that's um, relatively new in the space, I, I would say that's been a lot of growing pains for us internally, just um, making people, stakeholders, executives feel okay with that feeling of uncertainty. Of course, you, you have to know your own corporate level of risk with that. And certain brands would absolutely push the boundaries more than us as a, as a bank. Um, but I do think actually um, we've been able to push a little bit and, um, you know, go places maybe where they're a bit unexpected, but they're not so outside of the comfort zone. And what happens is actually in some cases unexpected, but really magical. And you have to be okay with letting go of uh, a little bit of that control. The other thing uh, I would also offer though, in those circumstances is um, sometimes when we interface with an artist or their camp, um, I think personally, again, I'm a bit biased, but once they hear a little bit about 
what we're trying to achieve, what we're doing, other things we've done in market, it allows them that same amount of comfort that it's not like just a random big brand coming in, trying to make them, you know, look as if they've sold out or something. I, I think when you can both kind of get over yourself a little bit and come closer to the middle, uh, that's where really interesting stuff happens. I think that's an incredible point, Shannon. And I think something that consistently has seen from a Wasserman perspective where we do sit on property and brand side is just the clarity of frankly purpose and objectives at the onset of a partnership not being defined. Um, I think it's just such a, an interesting thing to come back to that middle and actually say, here's what we're trying to accomplish. Let's do it together and actually build a partnership versus trying mm -hmm. to frankly leverage these artists and leverage their space and, and you know, for the benefit of the brand, um, I think is really important. And, and I think you guys, frankly, as RBC have done a really phenomenal job of building a vertically integrated strategy that also, you know, positions you guys as supporters, not trying to put yourselves as the star of the show, but really being an enabler and supporters of, of the actual uh, space, which is phenomenal. Thanks. Deirdre, have you noticed from an artist standpoint um, that you're getting more interest from artists or more willingness from artists um, as part of brand partnerships. I, I say that because over the last year, brands have in a way floated part of the live business with live mm -hmm. going away. And there's a niche that was filled that I would suggest is gonna continue going forward For, from an artist standpoint or even from the touring standpoint. Is there more desire for that going forward or, or what's the attitudes that you're seeing? I mean, I, I guess time will tell, but you, you're, you're bang on. Like there is, there was a lot, I think we've done more with artists over the past 16, 18 months, whatever it is, than we ever have before. I think that only helps like in, in terms of, again, like putting some like um, value towards brand partnerships, rev and new revenue streams. I think Shannon re referenced that before, um, money into artists pockets legitimizes what this is it's not just a paycheck there is something more meaningful that could be mutually beneficial between the artist and and the brand so um yeah i do think that there's been kind of some fundamental shifts in at least the way that artists and and perhaps even properties and promoters see brand partnerships bringing both what they're capable of bringing to the table and i think it only makes for a greater partnership moving forward between all parties and, and if you look at even from a brand side, particularly particularly if you're selling a product, we've seen over the last year that this is leaning into music as a way that you can reignite the product. Crocs, for example, with Post Malone or with yeah. Diplo more recently. If you talk to a Gen Z -er about Crocs two years ago, borderline irrelevant. Two years later, we've got a hot brand. I, I realize that this is a bit different when we're talking about financial services, but it's a way that for the right brand with the right mix, with the right values, uh, you can uh, you can really make an impact. Absolutely. I, uh, I do want to be conscious of time. I do also want to remind our audience that if you do have questions, um, I do have the ability to read them. So please, uh, please do fire them in here. I would like to, uh, to shift a little bit into what I'm going to call a speed round. Um, I'm also going to watch your lagging, Shannon. If you happen to leave, I'll just speed <laughs> round to, to Deirdre or Alan if we need to. But these will be questions for, uh, for, uh, for all three. So uh, Shannon, why don't I start with, with, uh, with you? Uh, who is an artist that you think uh, more people should know about? Oh, that's a tap in because we, I know we didn't really talk about it, but we've been doing a lot of um, support of emerging talent over the last year or so. Um, so I've, I've been exposed to some really cool um, Canadian artists. Um, there's two that kind of come to mind. One is um, a one by the name of Tomi, who actually just won a Juno on Sunday. Uh, for a reggae recording of the year. So she's she's great. And then um, Miranda Joan, who just has this otherworldly voice, um, which is which is awesome. So those would be a couple of call outs from me. Alan, same question. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm going to have to uh, obviously pump a uh, recently now Wasserman Music client, um, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> 
for, for me over, over the pandemic, it's been uh, camp with, uh, with two A's. If you're not I love with camp. Them. They're great. There you go. Yeah. So a couple, a couple guys out of, out of Ohio, I think, but like kind of like folk rock, bluegrass mix. Um, but for me, they've just felt very like uh, kind of familiar and honest uh, during this time. And especially as we go into summer, um, that would be kind of my reco. Deirdre? Um, to give some love to a Canadian artist, I'd say Tate McRae, big fan of hers. Um, and an album that I can't get enough of these days is Mount Joy. Don't know if you guys know Mount yeah. Joy, but they're awesome. Mm -hmm. And they're getting me through the past couple of weeks for sure. So <laughs> <a> heavy rotation. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question, we'll go, we'll go backwards this time. So I'll start with you, Deirdre. Uh, what is uh, the, what's an upcoming tour that you're most excited to see? I will literally go to any show <laughs> that presents <laughs> itself, um, but I am excited for Billie Eilish. Alan? Uh, I have the same answer as D of like any of them, all of them, <laughs> honestly. Uh, but uh, uh, for me, is I, I'm not sure if they're going to be touring, but uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the rumors around Arcade Fire hitting the road again would be uh, for me. because a lot of memorable moments uh, seeing them live in different venues around the world. Yeah, great show. Janet? I, uh, Alan, we should hang out more because I was going <laughs> to say that it um it's kind of a toss-up i think uh arcade fire and i heard uh pearl jam was going to be out there and so for me i'm i'm going to go to all and any show but those two would be highlights for sure love that okay I've, I've got two more um i do not want the answer to this question to be biased by those we see in the chat so if you've been reading please ignore that uh, tell me about a venue that you're most looking forward to being back in. I'll start, Alan, I haven't started with you, so you're on the hook first for this. Well, I'm going to give the obvious Canadian answer, um, which is because uh, it's also been going through a reefer, but is uh, Massey Hall, uh, but also countless, countless of some of those, uh, as I call kind of my, my favorite size venues, which is that two to three, 4,000 place where, you know, very intimate, certain smell, you know, historic venues, uh, countless of them of cities around North America that I couldn't even list. Uh, Shannon, I'll, I'll go to you uh, before Deirdre on this one. Okay, uh, expected answer would be RBC Echo Beach. I actually <laughs> genuinely love uh, an outdoor show. So uh, obviously Bud Stage would be great. Um, and then I hear there's a new uh, a new venue that Live Nation is is uh, opening. So I'd like to check that out because um, a small intimate show is always um, pretty pretty cool too. Thank you for leading the witness on that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. I know I just covered all my bases there. I know I've never seen a show there, but I'd be I'd be remiss if I did not say that I'm dying to get my feet into history which is uh, a new venue that Live Nation would have just announced actually this morning, uh, downtown. You and 2,500 of your friends intimate show there, Shannon. This is gonna be a great new room opening up, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed in the fall in collaboration with Drake, so cannot wait. I will, uh, I will end it on this question, which is uh, music related, should you want it to be, or, or not music related, should you want it to be, and not to go too to meta on it, but we've obviously lived through some pretty challenging times over the last year. We spent a, lo a lot less time with each other and we've had a moment to reflect. Can you, can you tell me something that you've learned over the last year? Again, either music or career related uh, or personal. You've all started once, so whoever's got their favorite answer first, start talking and then I'll, I'll talk to the second. I'll go. Clearing music rights is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned that <laughs> time and time again over this as we've pivoted to the digital content space. Alan? Uh, I'm going to go maybe a bit more uh, wide reaching, which is just to be more comfortable and embrace the opportunity that comes with uh, things that lie outside our control. That's nice. Wow. That was That's meta. Uh, mine is like halfway in between. Um, but I, I think I have done a better job of just appreciating those really small, simpler moments. Um, cause for a while there, that's kind of all we had. So, um, I'm going to hopefully hold on to that, um, in the future. 
I love that that's our last word. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Shannon, Alan, and Deirdre for joining us. I do also want to thank a whole bunch of people behind the scenes that have been putting on this conference today. So thank you for our, to our audience for watching. Thank you to our panelists for joining. And thank you to the army of uh, the people behind the scenes that have uh, put this on for us today. Thanks for spending an afternoon with us. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for hosting yeah, us. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Kevin. Thanks, thanks to guys. these tech people at Event Hub too for their help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thanks to our audience and uh, enjoy the rest of the session.